I'm Mark Angelo, Chair and Founder of World Rivers Day, and I want to thank the Explorers Club and Ann Passer for organizing this event tonight. Uh, tonight we'll focus on great rivers, uh, and I think to have a discussion like this is so timely in that yesterday we celebrated World Rivers Day. We had more than 100 countries participate. Uh, we had thousands of events, both virtual and physical, millions of participants, and uh, uh, it was an incredible day. Now, the objective of World Rivers Day is threefold. In the first, we strive to create a greater awareness of the many values of our waterways. Secondly, the event strives to create a greater awareness of the many pressures and threats that confront rivers. Uh, and lastly, the event strives to engage people to a greater degree with local waterways, which I think is so important. Now, rivers are the arteries of our planet, and I think Eric Taylor's forthcoming book, Rivers Run Through Us, really drives that point home. Uh, and, and while Eric's book elaborates on 10 great rivers in North America, his comments tonight will focus largely on the Colorado River, an incredible waterway that I've been very fortunate to have had the opportunity to, to spend a lot of time on. From its origins in the, uh, in the Southern Rockies to, to the wildness of the Grand Canyon stretch, to its delta, which now unfortunately uh, sees little, if any, flow of water in most years. Uh, but the Colorado remains a great river but it's also a river that's been hard hit by an assortment of pressures. And unfortunately, those, those kinds of pressures apply to many other rivers. Uh, tonight, you'll also hear about several other great rivers. You're going to hear from a renowned group of experts. You're going to talk about rivers from the Hudson to the Tigris Euphrates and from the Mekong to the Biosa. And each of those rivers has a remarkable and captivating story to tell. Uh, so once again, I want to thank the Explorers Club and I want to thank all the panelists tonight for all that they do for rivers. I want to thank all of those that participate in this evening's discussion. Uh, I wish you the very best uh, and I hope you have a great evening. Go ahead. You're live. No. Did we see Mark Angelo's video? Yeah, we just did. Ah, okay. <laughs> well, you saw it. I didn't see it. Anyway, we want to thank oh. thank Mark Angelo, uh, who's an internationally celebrated. Vivo. 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 Sí, sí. Hablamos. Hola. We're on Furnace Brook in Cortland. I prefer to call it the Jamawissa Creek. The Jamawissa means place a small beaver, and that's what the Native Americans called it. We're standing where a dam once stood for at least 100 years or more. There's no longer a dam. Last fall, we came in here with some machinery, a tractor with a breaker, they call it. And there's an exuberant joy that you feel when you see that thing demolishing that dam. And it's a form of liberation. To me, it was like tearing down the Berlin Wall. So that dam was here for well over 100 years. And within one day with that machine, we took it down. Dams impair the water quality. They heat it up. They create the potential for harmful algal blooms. And they block fish. The Hudson River flows from the sum total of all these creeks. So when we remove a dam, we also help the Hudson River. As I say, everything is connected. And these are like parts of the circulatory system of the river and its watershed. And we have damaged the ecology of the Hudson Valley and its watershed. Two, three, you are live now. 
Okay, we want to thank Mark Angelo, an internationally celebrated river conservationist, writer, speaker, teacher, and paddler from Burnaby, British Columbia. He's the founder and chair of both BC Rivers Day and World Rivers Day. Yesterday, September 26th, was World Rivers Day, which was created by, by Mark. Uh, he's been a, a conservationist on rivers for, for a couple, more than a few decades. Claims, and I trust him, to have, have been on a thousand rivers uh, in a hundred countries. Uh, one of, he, he, this is something that maybe our, one of our other guests, Rick Taylor, will know about, but he's received the Order of British Columbia and the Order of Canada as country's highest honor amongst other accolades in recognition of his global conservation efforts over the past five decades. So that's Mark, thanks for the introduction. We're gonna proceed. We've got a couple of very cool uh, programs here uh, to follow. I'm, I'm not, not gonna tease you with, with, with who they are. You, you, you probably already are aware. Um, I'm John Bowermaster. I, I, I guess this is coming from the Explorers Club. I'm, I'm up the river, straight up the Hudson River, about 90 miles. Um, I'm pretty lucky. I, I moved to the Hudson Valley 35 years ago and made it my home and really got to know both the valley and this beautiful river, which I sometimes egotistically call America's first river, uh, which could be argued. I also make the claim all the time that even though I have absolutely no empirical evidence or proof at all that there are more environmental activists in the Hudson Valley per capita than anywhere else in the country. I'm happy to debate that, but I, I, I sincerely believe it. Uh, I have a long... Uh, career as a writer and a filmmaker, uh, written a bunch of books and made more than 30 documentaries and have made films literally on every continent, including two in Antarctica and, and the first 3D movie shot on Antarctica. Uh, but for the past half dozen years or so, I've been focused on my own backyard. I mean, I think all of us who travel at some point realize that you don't necessarily have to travel halfway around the world to find good stories to find a good adventure. They're literally right outside your, your back door. And so we've kind of put that to the test and we've made 20 short films, kind of five minutes to 25 minutes that look at environmental issues up and down the, the Hudson River. We started out making films about risks, environmental risks to the river, which included on the Hudson, PCBs and a leaky nuclear power plant and oil transportation by cargo boat and train and pipeline, et cetera. And to be honest, I took those films around. We showed a bunch of them at the Explorers Club. And I got bummed out because I thought, you know, why am I so enamored of this place with all this horrific stuff going on? So we kind of pivoted and started making films that were more optimistic and more hopeful and made a series of uh, 10 films so far uh, called Hope on the Hudson, which out of my wildest expectations got picked up by Amazon. So people around the world are binging on uh, Hope on the Hudson stories, um, or at least I think they are. Um, I, work, I work quite closely with the group Riverkeeper, which was started here on the Hudson and uh, has spawned more than 300 different uh, organizations, water, uh, bay keepers, gulf keepers, et cetera, around, around the world. And one of the things they've been working on related to the Hudson River and related to a more hopeful, hopeful story is taking down the dams on the tributaries that have been around for 100, 150 years um, as a way to kind of regrow the arteries that feed the Hudson River from the, from the mountains and, and the hills. Um, it's been particularly uh, rewarding uh, because, you know, even though it's a slow process, there's 1,600 dams minimum, minimum on the tributaries of the Hudson. Uh, even though it's a slow process, as my friends there say, you know, these things went up one at a time, we're gonna take them down one at a time. So Alex, I don't know if you can hit play, but there's a short video I, I sent you about a, kind of a recent conversation we had on one of the banks of one of the tributaries. So let me know if you can hit play. We're on Furnace Brook in Cortland. I prefer to call it the Jamawissa Creek. The Jamawissa means place of small beaver, and that's what the Native Americans called it. We're standing where a dam once stood for at least 100 years or more. There's no longer a dam. Last fall, we came in here with some machinery, a tractor with a breaker, they call it. And there's an exuberant joy that you feel when you see that thing demolishing that dam. And it's a form of liberation. To me, it was like tearing down the Berlin Wall. So that dam was here 
for well over a hundred years and within one day with that machine we took it down. Dams impair the water quality. They heat it up, they create the potential for harmful algal blooms and they block fish. The Hudson River flows from the sum total of all these creeks. So when we remove a dam, we also help the Hudson River. As I say, everything is connected. And these are like parts of the circulatory system of the river and its watershed. And we have damaged the ecology of the Hudson Valley and its watershed beyond words. You know, the numbers of fish that were reported here by the first Europeans, they were dumbfounded by the, the number of fish that they saw, the number of waterfowl that they would see flying by in the fall. It's a fraction now, but we are in a position to try to heal. That's part of our mission. That's who we are as a river keeper. We are beholden to these creatures. That's what we work for. We work for the creeks and the organisms that live here. The Habitat Improvement and Dam Removal Program at Riverkeeper has become one of the pillars of the organization. And it'll never change. This is a frontier and we hope it becomes contagious to other organizations. We were the first and we worked in partnership with the DEC and we can see that this is going to expand and we hope many more will come down. Removing a dam, you change the world, not just for yourself or the creek, but for all the organisms. And you open up the habitat and you create these riparian corridors. Uh, you get to change the world. What more could you ask for? John? Yes. We're ready. Mm -hmm. One, uh, those two, are my friend. Three. Go ahead. Those are my friends from Riverkeeper, George Jackman and John Lipscomb. Uh, the other project I wanted to share with you tonight is also Hudson River based. Um, I'll, be, I'll be brief, but it's this really fantastic story of a, of a, of a, a, a man, an individual, a kind of quixotic character who has had this vision for the last half dozen years of creating uh, delivery up and down the Hudson River by sale. So no fossil fuels. He's gonna deliver wheat, grain, corn, uh, red oak, uh, CBD products, any, anything you can load onto the boat uh, from the town of Hudson, which is about hundred miles north of New York City, all the way down to Manhattan and, and Brooklyn. And they've just completed their second successful season. Um, I, I joke with, with Sam Merritt, the captain of the boat all the time, that he's, he's, he's Im imitating the Kennedys. He's doing like a booze run. He's just carrying malt and grain and wheat and, and products to beer makers and distillers. But it's, a, of which we all know who live here in the Hudson Valley are, are endemic up and down the, the river. But it's been great to watch him. I don't know, Alex, if you can put that picture up of the, uh, of the Apollonia, the schooner Apollonia in front of the tip of lower Manhattan. It's on. Yeah. Um, but, you know, they so they load everything up by hand. And then when they arrive in port, they deliver everything by electric cart or electric trike. And uh, it's working. They, they, they've gone every month and they're both carrying stuff down the river and then up. And we call it kind of the anti-Amazon, you know, for those things that don't you don't necessarily have to have immediately overnight. I, I find it to be quite uh, optimistic and hopeful. And, and and and, you know, the hope is it will spawn others. Uh, I'm not sure it's going to. You know, we, we've, it's not too hard. We, we zip across with our cameras to the other side of the river where we used to were in the port of Elizabeth and the port of Newark when they're unloading, you know, container ships from China. Uh, and and that, that's kind of his, <laughs> I hate to use that word competition, but it's kind of his competition. I don't think he's going to replace them anytime soon. By the way, it, it, go to, uh, if you want to look at more about the Apollonius, literally, I think all of his social media is just labeled the schooner Apollonia. And all of our uh, Hudson River stories are at HudsonRiverStories.com. Um, so I think we're going to watch a, a, a film from our friend Stefan Lovgren from Sweden, uh, if Alex can cue that up and, and hit play. Hi, I'm Stefan Lovgren. I'm a journalist writing about rivers and other global freshwater issues for National Geographic and others. I want to thank the Explorers Club for inviting me to speak to you today on World Rivers Day, 
a celebration of the world's waterways. I'm standing in front of one of the shortest rivers in Europe, Nordström. It runs maybe a quarter of a mile through my hometown of Stockholm, the Swedish capital, right past the seat of government here, and it connects Lake Mälaren with the Baltic Sea. I chose this spot because that's what rivers are, connectors. They connect people, economies and nature, carrying water and nutrients that are critical to all life on Earth. At the same time, around the world, rivers are under assault from poorly planned dam developments, pollution, a soaring demand for water to irrigate farms, and of course climate change. The result is that rivers, lakes and wetlands have become the most degraded ecosystems in the world. Just consider that in the last 40 years, freshwater species have, on average, lost 80% of their populations, declining twice as fast as land and marine species. And yet the freshwater crisis receives far less attention than other environmental emergencies, despite the fact that humans rely on the resources of rivers for drinking water, food and sanitation. Events like World Rivers Day are important to shine the spotlight on this crisis and the many challenges facing rivers globally. And today I'd like to share with you some of the reporting that I have done on this topic. We'll start in Southeast Asia and one of the most important rivers in the world, the Mekong. The Mekong River starts in the Tibetan highlands and runs through six countries in Southeast Asia. It directly or indirectly supports the livelihoods of 60 million people living in the region. I first started coming here about 15 years ago when I was doing a series of stories for National Geographic with Zeb Hogan, a fish biologist who was studying very large freshwater fish species, of which there are many in the Mekong. Zeb's quest was to find out what the largest freshwater fish in the world is, because this was still a mystery. In 2005, fishers in northern Thailand had caught a Mekong giant catfish weighing 293 kilos or 646 pounds. But it was unclear if the giant catfish was actually the largest species in the world. The fact that we didn't know the answer to this question is not as strange as it sounds, because there's a lot of things that we don't know about rivers. In comparison to oceans, for example, rivers are massively understudied. And that's even true for an enormously important river like the Mekong. In its natural state, the Mekong is an ecological marvel and one of the great biodiversity hotspots in the world. In the river system, there are almost a thousand species of fish. Tonlesap Lake, Southeast Asia's largest lake, which connects to the Mekong through the Tonlesap River, is the epicenter of the world's largest inland fishery. What sustains this incredible biodiversity is a flood pulse that shoots through the system during the monsoon season and which causes the Mekong River to rise as much as 40 feet. During this time, larvae and baby fish are swept down the river in what might be the biggest animal migration on Earth into the floodplains and the Tonlesap Lake where the fish feed and grow. So great is this flooding that the Tonlesap River actually reverses course during this time. After the wet season, the Tonlesap Lake empties out again as lots of fish migrate up the Mekong River to spawn and then the whole cycle begins all over again. But the Great Mekong Flood Pulse has been weakened because of dams built in the upper watershed in China and on many of the tributaries in Laos, Thailand and Cambodia. Dams not only block fish migrations, but also prevent crucial sediments from nourishing rice fields and farmlands downstream. Over the years I've been coming back to the Mekong, and much of my reporting is focused on the impact of these dams. In the last couple of years, things have taken a turn for the worse, with widespread drought also gripping the region. This drought is exacerbated by the changing climate, which is causing monsoon rains to become both shorter and more unpredictable, resulting in historically low water levels throughout the Mekong. 
At the same time, I've been amazed at the resilience of this river and its capacity to continue to deliver this incredible bounty for the people and animals living there. As much as possible, I've tried to tell these uplifting stories too, because they are as essential to the overall story about the Mekong River. Stories about how the isolated population of river dolphins in Upper Cambodia has actually increased because of good conservation programs and the return of giant soft-shelled turtles that were long thought to have disappeared from the Mekong. Since a few years back, I'm part of a large research project called The Wonders of the Mekong. The project has enlisted a lot of scientists from both the United States and Cambodia who are learning more and more each day about the Mekong and who are working hard to protect this magnificent river. It looks like it's in good shape. I'm also writing a book with Zeb about the plight of the world's largest freshwater fishes, called Chasing Giants. A recent study showed that today only one-third of the world's longest rivers remain free-flowing, meaning their natural flows have not been interrupted by man-made barriers. And most of those rivers are restricted to remote regions of the Arctic and to the Amazon and Congo basins. The continent where the rivers are the most fragmented is Europe. Another recent study found that there are at least 1.2 million obstacles preventing European rivers from flowing freely. That's more than one barrier for every mile of river. What this means, of course, is that these rivers can no longer provide the many diverse benefits to humans and nature that free-flowing rivers deliver. In Europe today, there's only one major river outside of Russia that remains free-flowing, and that is the Viosa River. Recently, I went to Albania to report on this incredible, pristine watershed, and it gave me a glimpse of what rivers in Europe and elsewhere around the world once looked like. The Viosa River starts high in the mountains of northern Greece and flows through Albania and into the Adriatic Sea. It's incredibly scenic, and like many Balkan rivers, it is home to one of the most biologically rich environments in Europe. The Balkans is the one area of Europe where rivers have, for the most part, remained pristine. But that may be changing. There are proposals to build more than 3,000 new hydropower plants throughout the dozen countries that make up the Balkans, which critics say could have devastating ecological consequences. So far, the Viosa has remained virtually untouched. Plans to dam the river began several decades ago, but environmentalists and conservation groups, both internationally and inside Albania, have successfully fought off those plans. And today, the Viosa is one of the last major European rivers that still runs wild. It's become a flagship for conservation efforts to protect rivers throughout the Balkans. For scientists, the Viosa and its many tributaries, most of which also remain untouched, are a chance to study what rivers in Central Europe, like the Danube and Rhine, once looked like before they were polluted, dammed and fragmented over the last two centuries. One scientist calls the Viosa the lost world of Europe. In a free-flowing river, water, silt and other natural materials can move along unobstructed. Fish and other animals can swim up and downstream at will, and the river itself can swell and shrink naturally, flow at an organic volume and rate, and replenish groundwater sources. In the Viosa and pristine tributaries like the Shuchichka and Bensha, you see this natural system at play. It's a stark contrast to the few rivers that have been dammed, like the Langaricha, a tributary to the Viosa which flows through a spectacular canyon that is also a national park, but where the last of three hydropower plants came online in 2015. It's not just dams that threaten the integrity of Viosa and its tributaries. There are plans to build a privately funded international airport in the Viosa River's Delta region, next to a previously protected wetland area that is connected to the vast Narta Lagoon. But things are changing in Albania. In a country that was long an isolated communist dictatorship, where any type of civic activism was totally suppressed, championing the environment is becoming more visible among the people, 
especially the younger generation. And that activism is showing results. The government recently declared the Viosa a nature park and vowed not to build any dams on it. But conservationists are not stopping there. They want to make Viosa and its tributaries a national park which would offer total protection for the rivers. It would be the first Wild River National Park in Europe. A survey shows that 94% of Albanians want the Viosa River to get the new designation. There are encouraging signs elsewhere in the Balkans too. Earlier this year, the prestigious Goldman Environmental Prize was awarded to a group of women from Bosnia-Herzegovina who occupied a bridge over a local river for over 500 days and nights, defying violent eviction attempts by the police to protest the construction of two hydropower plants there. It was the second time in the past three years that activists protesting against hydropower in the Balkans have won the award. Traveling around the world and witnessing the declining state of many of our world's great rivers, it's easy to despair. But then I come to a place like the Viosa and it fills me with hope that it's not too late to save our watersheds. The ecological and economic benefits of maintaining healthy rivers are increasingly clear, as are the solutions for how to do it. And we need to move fast if we're going to save ecosystems that are crucial to the survival of both animals and humans. Uh, couldn't be with us now. He's home in Sweden. Um, and I, he did a little bit of an intro, but I can I give you a little more info before before we move on. Uh, Stefan's an award-winning journalist and filmmaker with over 25 years of international reporting experience, frequent contributor to National Geographic. I know him from somewhere. He and I have traded emails, but I can't remember where we met. Uh, and he often writes about rivers, lakes, wetlands around the world. I liked the, in the video that he mentioned that one third, only one third of the, of the rivers in the world today are free flowing, remain free flowing. It was relevant to that little Hudson River piece. I mean, there, and, he, and he went on to say that most of the free flowing rivers are in the Arctic, far from, from uh, accessibility. Anyway, thanks to Stefan for that. And uh, I, I wanna move on, I wanna welcome Jenny Purnell. Hello, Jenny. Hi, John. Oh, good. <laughs> you know, I, I, I often, uh, uh, when I go into offices at National Geographic, my, my biggest, uh, uh, if there's a big wall map of the, of the world on the wall, uh, my, my eyes go right to the stands, right to Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, et cetera, because it's a place I don't know at all. And I feel so re remorseful that it may never be a place that I visit, which is such well, a drag. Well, come on with us the next trip. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to introduce Jenny. Next month. <laughs> yeah, are oh, you going back next? I'm going to introduce Jenny. I, I won't be, but my colleagues are. I'll probably be back in December. <laughs> okay. But didn't you just return from, from the Mideast? No, no, I was in Italy for, for, for to oh, okay. escape the summer heat. <laughs> okay, but today you're on the, the, the sandy beaches of South Carolina. Well, no, not exactly. I mean, no. the Carolina sand hills. It was the sandy beaches, oh, about 100 million years ago. Okay. <laughs> now it's just the hot, centrally isolated home of the state capitol. Nice. Well, I'm going to give a proper introduction to Jenny Purnell, uh, Dr. Jenny Purnell, Dr. Jennifer Jenny Purnell, uh, Distinguished Research Professor Emerita of the University of South Carolina School of Earth, Ocean, and Environment landscape archaeologist. For two decades, she has explored, filmed, and written about Iraq's rivers. Iraq's rivers, uh, yeah. And their role in promoting and sustaining civilizations. I like the fact that you're especially concerned with interactions that affect urban sustainability over thousands of years. Her work concentrates on the origins and life lifespans of Mesopotamian cities in the lower Tigris-Euphrates Delta of southern Iraq, there where the world's oldest known longest lived cities were founded in what became ancient Sumer, urban life has flourished continuously for over 6,000 years. Tonight, she's gonna to share with us a story about uh, her work on the, on the, on the Tigris Euphrates and her ponderings on the futures of, future of cities. Um, great, thank you, Jenny, take it away. Thanks so much. 
Okay, I'll just uh, share my screen here. And because no one can actually speak without um, a slide deck anymore, right? <laughs> so as John said, I, I began working actually in feet on the ground in Iraq in 2003, but I began working on Iraq and particularly um, the Tigris and Euphrates rivers in about 1998, 1999. Um, and in the course of that, I, I, I came to understand that the questions that I'd been handed to ask weren't actually very good questions. And I, in the course of this talk, I, I think I'll be able to show you a little bit about why. So in case there's anyone left in the universe who doesn't know where Iraq is, here it is. And it was specifically Mesopotamia, the land between the rivers, Meso between Tamia, uh, Potami, the rivers, um, is in, known through ancient times um, as being the home of Assyria. Uh, Assyria is the northern steppe region, so it's often called Syro Anatolia, that's Syria, northern Iraq, southern Turkey here. And Assyria is where really Europe and the West got its first direct engagement with, with that part of the world, with that part of Mesopotamia. For a long time, Mesopotamia in most people's heads meant that part of Iraq and Syria, um, the, the upper part, the part where they imagined Roman, Roman ar armies had marched through and they had, uh, so had many others. That engagement, really intensified it around the time of the First World War, and biblio, biblical archaeology was in for full swing. And so what people looked for and at were things that reminded them of biblical scenes or biblical uh, names, such as, for example, the story of Abraham. And here's an example of the kind of thing they were filming at the time, because it reminded them of these things. So this is an excerpt from the Fox Movie Tone Archive. And this is a picture of a wooden water wheel being turned by an ox who to prevent his, to help him tolerate his boredom is blindfolded. Okay, so that's the kind of thing that got captured in the imagination of people visiting Iraq then and visiting Mesopotamia then. But this talk is primarily, primarily concerned with what happens downstream and what became known as Babylonia. Babylonia being the lower part of the Euphrates and Tigris rivers all the way down into the what's now the Arab Persian Gulf. Babylonia, of course, was named for the city of Babylon. And here are Babylon's reconstructed walls and you are actually looking at the course of the Euphrates uh, along in the distance. <clears throat> From Babylon southward in Iraq, over a period of oh, 30, 40 years, archaeological surveyors identified thousands of settlements, both on the ground and then subsequently using various kinds of satellite photography and aerial imagery. Um, I'm often asked, how do you tell it's an archaeology site when you're looking at imagery? And the answer is, well, once you've found the first 3,000, the next 2,000 are easy. You get to know what they look like. Within Babylonia, Babylonia is really uh, separated into two parts. The northern alluvium, that is where the water emerges onto the plains of, of southern Iraq, which was the home of the world's oldest known empire, Akkad. And Akkad is often what people think of when they think of this part of the world. Akkad was a place of agriculture. We know this because the people who were first do doing archeology span in that part of, of Iraq were very interested in agriculture. The idea was that agriculture is what founded civilization and agriculture was impossible without irrigation. And to give you an idea of the scale of agriculture in the periods we're talking about now, so something like, oh, you know, not quite 5,000 years ago, this is just one tablet recording the grain production of one buru or 64,000 hectares of fields. And what you see here is a canal, the irrigation 
drains, okay, the irrigation lines that run through the fields, and then the drainage canal that takes away the irrigation water. So a million acres would be about 6.5 buru, and there were, grain was grown on hundreds and thousands of buru of land. So from a cod, we have this picture of civilization being all about irrigated agriculture and that irrigated agriculture depending upon the Euphrates River. The thought was that the Tigris was too deeply incised to have contributed. But I wanna shift focus to what happens south of there in Sumer. Why? Because that's where the first known cities in the world were found. Egypt follows along two or 300 years later, but Sumer beats them hands down in terms of having something that anyone would identify as a city. Big, big uh, administrative architecture, religious architecture, um, uh, wealthy homes, suburbs, all, all the kinds of things that you would walk to, into marketplaces and say, yep, this is a city. If you did it today, you would recognize it. And Sumer transitions from this upper alluvium of grain, heavy grain agriculture and irrigation, that's not all they did, but that's what we know most about, down into what at the time was the delta formed by the Tigris and Euphrates, and then continuing on into the sea lands. And most of my work has been trying to figure out when was the Gulf where it is now and when wasn't it? Because about 6,000 BCE, so about 8,000 years ago, it first reached the levels it has now or the shoreline it has now. But before that, for a couple of thousand years, it had actually encroached on this area. In other words, the delta was a checkerboard of the rivers flowing into it and the sea lands that were flowing out of it. And you can see the impact of that if you really pay attention, not to just where all of the identifiable sites are, but where the sites for any given period are first founded. So these are sites of the Uruk period. That's about, oh, 5,000 years ago, five and a half thousand years ago. And they're all concentrated in this area, the earliest known ones of these. And then you go along for a little bit, uh, a few hundred more years, and now a lot of these are still there, but the new sites are being founded out further to the southeast. And then you go along for about 500 more years, and now all the new sites are out here on the eastern fringe. And what that tells me is we're watching little sites that are feeding back up to the cities. We're watching these, these sites follow the delta as it progrades to the southeast. As the Tigris and Euphrates build their de deltas to the southeast, then all of the little sites follow. Now that doesn't fit very well with a picture of irrigated agriculture being at the center of civilization. In fact, here's the oldest known, definitely a city, Uruk. I've, this is a picture taken from the top of the Urnamu ziggurat. Urnamu was a newcomer. The, the reeds produce it, protruding from this um, layer of mats are uh, radiocarbon dated at about 2200 BCE, so a little over 4,000 years ago. So by the time this ziggurat was built, Uruk was already 2,000 years old as a city. Everything you see in this image, everything was human made. Everything you see is either mud brick or denuded mud brick. And this is a view out to another cigarette on the plane. And as far as you can see on the, on the horizon here, those were the city walls. Uh, for those of you familiar with the Epic of Gilgamesh, this is the city that Gilgamesh ruled. So Uruk is the oldest known city, but quick on its heels is founded a seaport at Ur. So Uruk is at where the rivers splay out or the river splays out into its delta and downstream away, the city of Ur gets founded as a seaport. And then after that, Ur grows up and the city of, of Kisiga gets founded as a seaport. And after that, and so forth and so on. And so what you have is this progression as the Delta progrades of a big city, its seaport, they bloom, they found a new seaport, they bloom, they found a new seaport, all the way down 
through the progradation of the delta as the, the, the uh, seashore uh, <clears throat> uh, recedes until we get to the present day city now on a river, now a river port and its seaport at, 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 uh, at Uncasar and Fao. Um, here's a lovely picture of Basra taken in about the 1960s. It was known as the Venice of the East uh, as late as 1970. Um, you can see the old Shanashil, the, the Ottoman period houses with their, their uh, balconies out over the water. And the city was cooled by six, six creeks, that is tidally flushed waterways. As the tide came in, it pushed the fresh water back up into the city. As the tide went out, it, it, it uh, let the water come back out. Much as happens in Venice. So the city by comparison to the surrounding countryside was cool, it was clean, it was incredibly well watered. And just to give you an idea, the, the huge port at Fao is a container port and in, includes all of the infrastructure for um, uh, petroleum shipping and so forth. But this little key here, as you can see, filled up with little uh, boats made of wood that are still used by people to fish um, uh, already. This, this picture was taken in about uh, the year 2000, so they were still fishing out of these boats. The size of this key in port is about the same as the size of the ports at Ur, at Uruk, at all of the cities that you walk track down the Zelta. And it brings us the question, what were these cities thriving on? If they're huge cities at a river port right at the edge of the marshes, with a seaport down, uh, down on the coast, what was their real economic base? And the answer isn't grain agriculture, it isn't wheat. Yes, they grew grain, they also grew a lot of barley. Um, they invented uh, barley beer in the way that we know it in must. So all you folks on the Hudson have them to thank for that process. The economic basis for all of this was what we think of as a weed, Phragmites reeds. Phragmites reeds are pictured um, on, on cylinder seals and all sorts of, of uh, glyptic iconography going back to these earliest picture periods. These, this reed hut, which is used to house sheep outside of which are cattle is uh, accompanied by reed bundles. Uh, that's what these are, which are symbols of Inanna who is the goddess of among other things, reeds. It gives you an idea of how integrated this is. This is a typical marsh boat. This is the N or the king with his cattle and his naked slaves going through the reed beds um, to visit his outlying um, sites. Reeds were the primary fodder for all of the livestock. In fact, the chemical composition of these reeds is the same as, as fairly high quality hay. I could feed this to my horses tomorrow. They love it. Uh, they, they love it absolutely. In fact, reeds were what, for what originally attracted people to Boston and the Boston Harbor, put things up in the Northeastern perspective. The reed country is cattle country, it's grass country, it's free fodder. How much free, free fodder? 60% of the entire feedstock is reeds. When it's dried and stacked like this, it's known as kusab. Kusab means hay. That's, that's what it's called. Here's an example of Kusab being transported down the river, in this case, down the Tigris. It's also the major component of construction at the earliest levels of, of Ur, uh, well before it was a city when it was not much more than a fishing camp with a little tiny river port. There are, there are uh, houses constructed, guess what, of reed bundles and the equivalent of plaster and lath, that is plastered reed that is used to construct the walls. And more pictures you can see of there's the sheep again and the cattle again coming out of root houses. The idea that reed construction is ancient is true. It's, uh, it's at least uh, six and a half thousand years old that we can prove, but it continued right up until the very near present. And construction can mean anything from a temporary camp like this picture at top, which is used by reed cutters while they're cutting reeds in order to uh, split them and weave them into mats, which were exported throughout Iraq all the way as far north as Turkey by the millions up through the 1980s. In fact, uh, community organizations, we can figure out this is a, an Ishan. So 
something bigger than a hamlet, not quite a town, uh, but it is a community of, if you will, reed farmers. That is, they raise cattle, sheep, um, uh, water buffalo. These are the mud brick foundations of reed structures that get built and rebuilt every year. Uh, Ishan just means an island, and most of these islands are factors sitting on top of archaeological sites. In other words, they've been in continuous use for a long time. When the rivers flood, and this is right in the Euphrates flood zone, that's okay. Everybody takes to their boats, moves to slightly higher ground, doesn't matter if a certain amount of the reeds wash away, they simply rebuilt the, rebuilt the tops of the houses. Some of these constructions are enormous and, and, and actually quite a lot of work. You need to be wealthy. This is an example of a, of a human-made Ishan. There is a reed fence built here and lots of reed muck is piled on top and eventually an island is built. Somebody undertakes to do this when they decide they need to expand their holdings. They use the reeds to make more ground, if you will. And here's an example of there's, there's a, a sheep buyer, a cattle buyer, and then a household, and probably that's another house back there. Other examples, I love to ask people, who's the wealthiest? Anybody in the South gets this in one. They just count the pillars. One, two, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five. That's the wealthiest. That's the equivalent of a five of a five column plantation house. This is a huge homeowner, okay, a huge, huge householder. Reed matting, as I said, by the millions were shipped out. The most uh, iconographic uh, image is that for construction is that of the Mudif, the coffee house, which this one was built back in the 50s. This one was built in about 2000. You need to be wealthy to build one because a lot of labor is involved. What's missing out of that picture of construction though is the hundreds of millions of mud bricks that were used right up until the very near present to build everything. The component of mud brick, the major component of mud brick you would think is mud. Well, yes, there's a certain amount of, of, of mud and mud brick, but an even bigger component is chaff. And it was presumed that the chaff was coming from wheat. But now that we've actually done analysis of the remains of the chaff left in mud brick, we can see that most of that chaff in Iraq doesn't come from wheat at all. It comes from reeds. It is chopped up reed. That is what's left over if you've fed the cattle. Here's an example of, of chaff being hauled by the ton, by multiple tons, in this case up and down the Nile, same principle. So all of this chaff isn't being hauled for food, it's being hauled as a major component of construction of brick. Beyond that is fuel. Of course, we think of fuel in terms of cooking. And right to this day, if you want to have mazguf, which is wonderful, head off and split fish. It's put into these framed and grilled over open coal fires, yum yum. And tanur or tandoor ovens, uh, fairly common throughout the world. The coffee that you'd be served in your mudif. But that's small potatoes compared to the amount of fuel that was necessary to fire all that brick and to fire the literally millions of bevel rim balls that have been found dating back to the early Uruk period or to the later Uruk period, sorry. So these particular bowls, 5,000 5, years old. And that reed would continue to be used right up until the very recent past. When, when there wasn't enough reed, they switched to using petroleum product fuels. Of course, marshes are a great place to grow rice. We know that very well here in South Carolina. Carolina gold is like the Kleenex of rice in most of the world. If you go to the soup in Dubai, you will see a rice trader whose name is Carolina rice. Now we no longer produce the rice here. We produce the rice because of exactly the technology used to produce it here. It was produced beginning in early Islamic times in Southern Iraq by slave labor, the slaves imported from Africa, uh, because they knew how to use the trunk, and uh, the trunk systems for controlling the water flow through rice fields. And it's an enormous part of a traditional meal, well, traditional, it's like barbecue, um, barbecue if you're there, of mazguf that head off and split fish that's been grilled over the reed fire. Dwarfing that production was until, very, until the 1980s, the production of date farms. 
nine million medjool palms. Those are the big, fat, juicy dates. Not the little hard, dry ones we get at Christmas, but the big, juicy ones, if you've ever been to Indio Valley in California, that are used to make a date shake. Um, it was the source for that California imagery, they, uh, imagery, that industry, those date palms came from Vasra. In fact, up until the 80s, 80% 80 of world exports of dates came from around, came from Iraq, mostly from around Basra. And it wasn't just the dates, 60% of them were packaged in reed baskets. So without the reeds, there was no shipping. Now for us, for whom dates aren't a huge part of the diet, that seems insignificant, but throughout a lot of the Middle East and South Asia, they're a major support, a major form of, of calories. And date palm groves aren't just date palms, they're triple canopy production gardens. The top canopy is the date palm. It shades uh, from the, the, the heat of the worst heat of the sun. Under that, you can see a glimpse of it behind these lads who are playing with my camera. Um, it is an understory of orchards, pomegranate, apricots, peaches, you name the fruit. And then below that is an understory of herbaceous foods and vegetables. This in fact is a parsley meadow and she's uh, cutting parsley for the daily take to the uh, local farmer's market. Obviously where you have water, you have fishing. Less obviously where you have water, unless you're along the coast and like to roast up a, a, a barrel full of co uh, cohogs or, or oysters is shell fishing. It was a huge industry um, in ancient times. This is an early dynastic fellow carrying a pair of carp. This is a cosmetic kit in cockle shells. Um, these are little fish tokens, all of these dating back four or 5,000 years. These are lads heading off for the day's catch in a local lake. In fact, the local Hamar marshes were uh, the producers of tremendous quantities of fish preserved primarily by drying. Dried fish uh, was in every household. It was a winter staple. And you can see either head off, split, splayed and dried, uh, an image that is, uh, is, uh, occurs throughout imagery of the early archaic periods or simply dried whole. And of course there's fish sales direct off the boats, direct off the docks and so forth. So, the point of this quick run through is that the coastal marshes, remember, however, that the coast was constantly on the move. For 5,000 years, the coast was creeping towards its present position. But the coastal mar marshes are and always were an essential part of the urban ecosystem. The urban ecosystem did not depend on grain. The state depended on grain. It depended on grain sales because it could ship grain everywhere for cash. But that's not what the people were eating. That's not what they were building their houses from. It's not what they were cooking with. What they were primarily using was all of these marsh products. Irrigation and sediment deposition go hand in hand. That is the more irrigated agriculture there was. This is a so-called herringbone system from the third dynasty of Ur that was one of the Babylonian dynasties that uh, grew out of the king, kingships of Ur. These happened up on the levees, the big broad kilometer wide levees of these rivers where the soil was drain, had better drainage. It was only about a meter above the plain below, but that was enough to keep it from getting salinized. And then those systems would get reused. This is a Sasanian, that is a Persian early Christian uh, around 400 uh, AD system that was superimposed on top of this Ur 3 system. And then here's a modern system. You can see this one was put in in the 60s, laser leveled fields and a, in a grid work hashure. So these soils have been used and reused. And every time one of these systems goes in, it accelerates the amount of sediment that gets washed downstream on these rivers, which then builds out the deltas and builds out the marshes. That has been coped with ecologically for thousands of years. And that's one of the reasons why the small sites were following the prograding delta down towards the Southeast. The other thing that's been coped with for 5,000 years is flooding. The first major Western irrigate, uh, 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 
uh, intervention in Iraq, in, in the Iraqi um, uh, river systems, the Euphrates and the Tigris, were flood control gates at, uh, at, at Hilla and Kut. And the point of these was to stop um, floods from wiping away the irrigation systems that had been established and reestablished along the older channels. But that wasn't new either. Every single city in, in antiquity had to control water. Uh, it came to a point where it put in a lot of hardscaping to keep the water out of the city center and off in the city sides. And over the course of time, what this did, you can see these ancient water courses, the oldest and then the next oldest. What over time the sediment disposition did is not only did it grow the delta southeastward, but it pushed the rivers apart. Part of that was natural deposition by the floodwaters themselves. A large part of it was the accelerated deposition that is a result of all the irrigation up here upstream. And those of you who work in American river systems understand that process very well. I got interested though in the things I was showing you by noticing that nevertheless, there was all this activity down here and that it continued from Uruk to Vasra a length of 120 kilometers, that that area was consistently and continuously urbanized for 6,000 years. And that was quite an accomplishment. So even by the mid 1970s, if you look at the triangle from, from uh, 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 Amara to Nasiriya to Basra, that's called the Ahwar, it just means the marshlands, both permanent marshes and seasonal marshes. It was still pretty much intact as of the 1970s. And in fact, this superimposition, this is a false color image. Um, everything red on this should be brilliant green. It gives you an idea of how far those marshes extended. There are cities throughout here, okay? So it's not as if this is just empty or vacant or waste land until we get to the late 1980s. Beginning with the Iran-Iraq War, this is the Shat al-Arab, the confluence of the Tigris and Euphrates are here at Korna. And all of this was those 9 million medjool date palms. Every single one of them was cut down to allow artillery, free fields of fire back and forth across the river. The University of Basra itself was, uh, was shelled multiple times, destroyed and rebuilt twice. At about the same time, construction had begun on the Ataturk Dam at the very high, uh, the, the upper Euphrates up in the southeastern Turkey. At that time, the largest dam in the Middle East, sixth largest in the world, and it slowly began filling its reservoir. I was first introduced to it in the 1990s when I was working at a little uh, archaeological site at a city called um, uh, Titrish near the village of Bocheli, almost underwater right at the edge of that little finger there. So this is what it looked like before and after the fill. A huge problem with filling any dam, but particularly in any region, I'm sorry, in arid regions, is that once you fill it, 40% of the water, surface water evaporates. And so you're already losing 40% of the flow simply to evaporation because you're holding the water back. Why did they do that? Electricity and agriculture, irrigated agriculture up there in the Southeast. Then came Operation Desert Storm. Now Desert Storm didn't maneuver directly through the marshlands there up here. But those of you old enough to remember will recall that President Bush called on the Southeast, that's the marshes, that's exactly the area we're talking about, to rise up in support of this operation and for the city of Basra to do the same, and they did. And so when Desert Storm was over and all these forces retreated behind the borders with Saudi Arabia and Kuwait, Saddam Hussein uh, launched a retaliation plan. And this is not me saying this, this is what he said he was doing, revenge. It began by cutting the Mother of Battles Canal. This canal right here runs along the Iran-Iraq border and you can see patchwork of water in it. It was cut as a major drain to start pulling water out of the marshes. And you can see that was largely accomplished along here. Then was built, the, the main outfall drain was completed. Now this wasn't done as a matter of retaliation, 
But what it meant was all of this irrigated land up here in Akkad, all of those outfall drains that were draining the, the salty water off of, the, uh, off of those fields was now being taken out of the water cycle and dumped directly into the Gulf. It now bypassed the entire system. Then came Glory River, and that was the next major cut channel. It is near, each of these, by the way, are nearly a kilometer wide. These are not insignificant little drains. And so that was done partly to finish the draining uh, process, but also to accelerate drainage of the West Kernel oil field to make it easier for oil extraction to happen. And then that was followed by gridding the entire marsh system every kilometer and then every hundred meters with cross-cutting drains to finish the job. This is an example of one. That's a 10 meter wide um, uh, uh, drain. It was completely polder. They brought in, they, in fact, they activated plans that had originally been developed by Belgian engineers in the 1950s, but never implemented because it was clear that draining this land would not produce agricultural land. It would produce nothing more than dead marsh. And so by 1997, remember all of this being bright red? All of this is barren now. The, the red, red green that you see here is what's left of irrigated farmland and all of the rest is gone. And here's another comparison of those two things. 73, the extent of the marshes, 2000, all that's left is a little patch, most of which is on the Iranian side at Hawiza. The impacts of this were not insignificant. Obviously waterways were desiccated. That's, that goes without saying. But entire towns were abandoned. If they weren't abandoned voluntarily, they were bulldozed. And that displaced people. You can see this is what should be marsh villagers, but now they're building out of tin and they're clustered along the roadside because that's the only line of communication anymore. You can no longer travel by boat through waterways. All fresh water was basically gone. Uh, there was no potable fresh water left in Southern Iraq. Well, there is now one reverse osmosis um, uh, uh, water treatment plant in Nasriya. Um, almost 100% of drinking water in the south of Iraq is imported from uh, Kuwait and, and, and the, the re reverse osmosis plants in Kuwait. And this meant that there is a new industry in settling water tanks and building uh, private reverse osmosis uh, purifiers. This is at the University of Basra. If 100% of your water comes in water bottles, that means those water bottles are scattered all over the countryside. And you can't avoid doing that because the other thing that happened almost immediately with this hyperaridity was massive temperature spikes. Now, doesn't this look all green and lovely? Except look at this chart. Yet this is hot enough out here in, Ara in, in Saudi Arabia, okay? But on this chart, the green is 130 degrees. What used to be one of the coolest parts of, and was the coolest part of Southern Iraq and was temperate all through the summertime because of the cooling effect of the marshes and of the rivers isn't there anymore. And so the microclimate is completely and permanently altered. It's like Death Valley. What's left of water on the surface is now highly salinized. That means you can't use even the water that you, you can now get. You can't use it to irrigate anything because if you do, you kill it. It's not just the surface water, also the groundwater. So what palms were left now, palms along the Tigris and Euphrates further up river are now dying off because of the salinization. So that's the loss, not just of the marshland palm groves, but the rest of the palm groves. And remember, when you lose the palms, you lose the understory. You lose the orchards, you lose the vegetables, you lose the herbs. There's nothing left. The hot, salty water and hot, polluted water leads to anoxia. When water is 120 degrees or 100 degrees, it can't hold oxygen. We measured the oxygen uh, level here and the dissolved oxygen level here was zero. This fish kill went on for almost two kilometers. And let me tell you, the stench was worse than eye watering. It's not just that, what catch there is, this was this guy's entire catch of the day, is stunted in growth, if, if at all. 
And so Iraq, which used to be a net exporter of fish to the entire region, is now a net importer of fish, mostly from Myanmar. The water that remained on the surface is highly toxic and highly polluted. And when livestock drink it, they die. Actually, it doesn't show up very well in this picture, but there are, are uh, water buffalo bones all, all through this, this uh, what used to be this piece of marsh. Uh, within three years, all the livestock had died off from drinking the water. And then down in the city, you now have massive floods. You'd think less water would be fewer floods, but it's not because now what water there is after a heavy rain just comes barreling in across that hot, dry surface and accumulates in the lowest points, which, which happens to be the urban streets. Because of that, the livestock, such as it is, is being moved into the cities. And the cities, nobody wants sheep grazing on their front yard and nobody wants water buffalo grazing in their city parks. But what are you going to do? shoot people, shoot their livestock. It's turned Basra, which was very much a first world city in 1988, into something that you would not even see necessarily in most of Mumbai now. You might see it in the slums and the outskirts, but certainly not in the central city. And worse than that, people need water and that livestock need food. So that means what reeds are left in the marshes get cut and they have to be cut and they have to be cut and trucked into the cities to feed that livestock. And what happens to the money from the sale for livestock feed? Well, then the former marsh dwellers use it to buy water. So they're selling their reeds to feed urban livestock so they can buy water. This is the extent of that. And I'll just show a bit of this clip you should be seeing here reed beds 21 feet high as far as the eye can see. But as you can see, as far as the eye can see, the reed is the the And that's the blue. So the now, needless to say, this has resulted in agricultural collapse. It's also resulted in skill substitution. No more do you have mud brick yards where people make millions of mud bricks, local material, no, carb no carbon footprint whatsoever. It doesn't produce methane. Instead, they've had to shift to commercial Portland cement concrete, which has an enormous carbon footprint when it's manufactured and then continues to radiate methane throughout its entire life. And the people who used to know how to make mud brick no longer know how to do that. That's one example. So a lot of attempts have been made to restore this. Um, in 2003, uh, uh, a couple of folks uh, uh, got a lot of press for knocking down dams and just letting water reflood areas. And at first that seemed like a great idea, um, but the amount of water available because of upstream damming the whole way along the Zagros mountains and thus limiting the amount of water that flows into the Tigris meant that there wasn't very much to use. And such as there was, was draining out almost as fast as it could drain in. Billions of dollars were spent poldering this land, and there were not any billions of dollars to undo that job. Secondly, massive construction. The one thing that happened on a lot of the newly dry land was, remember the concrete blocks? Well, it started with massive construction to fill, fill, fuel military projects, and then it began the new oil boom, and followed behind that, the new construction boom in Basra itself. The land value in Basra, believe it or not, is among the highest in the world. The problem with just adding water is when you drain a marsh, what's left is not a drained marsh. What's left is mobilized toxicants. The marsh reeds had been very good in sucking all of the pollutants, the agricultural pollutants, uh, herbicides, pesticides, excess fertilizers, the industrial pollutants, and particularly the petroleum pollutants down into their root balls and deep down into the mud. But when the water is gone and the mud is dry, then what happens is it all just blows away. And when it blows away, you get what's called a haboot a dust storm. 
And that dust storm isn't just dust anymore. It's dust plus all of those vehicles. This is dust consuming a military base. Not a border. Imagine getting away yeah. from that. Oh, we'll find out in a it second. It infiltrates everywhere. <laughs> And it will eventually roll over this entire scene. In fact, it rolls on the prevailing winds all the way down the Gulf. Some of the earliest attention that was paid to this problem got paid because the UAE, Qatar, uh, cities like Dubai, Bahrain began seeing huge upsurges in the incidence of respiratory illnesses. And it was because they were breathing this dust. At that point, the World Health Organization began paying attention to rock and realized it was not going to be So UNEP has kept ongoing effect, uh, efforts. Uh, in 2008, they launched another big uh, campaign for marsh restoration. This campaign, however, was also ill-advised. Once again, it involved simply diverting water from that main outfall drain and dumping it directly into the Western Hamar Marsh to try to bolster the, bolster the flow. The problem with that is that's highly polluted water and they were dumping it into the least polluted part of the marsh that on the Euphrates. The same thing has subsequently begun happening in Hoiza. So instead, while it may have increased the amount of area that was underwater, it severely degraded marsh quality heat, uh, in the West and the marsh quality in the east was insufficient to maintain life for anything that we cared about living. In summary, the consequences of, of this huge assault on the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, upstream damming, massive uh, uh, expansion of irrigated agriculture, complete suppression of all flood pulsing, uh, the willful draining of the marshes, is all of the things that you see here. All of the ecosystem services, all of the things the environment did for free, and particularly acting as a normal set of kidneys and liver uh, for, for the rivers was gone. And it just is, isn't just a matter of losing biodiversity, economic collapse, massive migrations, tourism collapse, infant mortality, child mortality, adult mortality, disease and death rates, losses to navigation and refining infrastructure, it's really been devastating. There is some hope. By about 2013, 14, I was convinced enough of the results of my own work on, on marshes and antiquity and their role that I decided that really I needed to turn my attention to helping fix this problem. And we identified what can be done. What can we do right now? There's still a lot of water down there. There's urban surface wastewater. There's sewage treatment plant effluent. There's a lot of produced water, byproducts of petroleum production. Can we do something with that? And so we began modeling based on really 1980s and 90s technology that's in the United States, mixed system tertiary treatment. That is using them, constructing marshes from wastewater in order to refurbish marshes. Um, initial results are being tested at the University of Basra. And this fellow, Jassim al-Maliki, deserves a medal. He literally fed his kids nothing but tomatoes so that he could finish work on this project. He had no money. And build um, from scraps this triple wastewater treatment plant. This is, urban, this is sewage from the University of Basra, raw sewage. It goes through a reed bed, then a cattail bed, then a coontail bed, and it comes out meeting EPA water quality standards with no other treatment. He's now working to ramp this project up on every creek in Basra, on every creek in Nasria, and they're going to try to carry it to every creek feeding into the Tigris and Euphrates from Baghdad on south. The story of Iraqi civilization, that is 6,000 years of civilization threatened within 50 with utter collapse, isn't unique. There are many rivers that no longer uh, uh, reach the sea, including all of these homes of major civilizations, several in the US that we're gonna hear more about. 
And at this point, I'm going to turn over. Um, I probably exceeded my time. It's hard to talk about 6,000 years in 15 minutes. And uh, back to you, John. Thank you, Jenny. It elicits just as many questions as it does answers. So hopefully we'll, 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 we'll be able to get back to you. I have one simple question. Where did you grow up? Oh, uh, pick a year. Spent early childhood in, in uh, among other places, Vancouver and Seattle and Puget Sound, then moved to Southern California, then moved to Southern Louisiana, then moved to Indiana, did a degree in Michigan, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> I have spent all of my life on one river or another, but a lot of different ones. <laughs> okay, great. Well, thank you very much. And Rick, hello, how are you? Well, thank you. Oh, good. I'm going to introduce Rick Taylor, who's currently somewhere in central British Columbia, I think. And if I understood his comment earlier in the day, in order to get to a, a place with proper internet, it required a three hour drive, something like that? No, just one. Just one hour drive, one hour drive to get to good internet. Okay. Well, thanks for, thanks for making the effort and thanks for hanging in there. Uh, Rick is a professor of zoology at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, where he studies the origins of biodiversity in fishes and has necessitated, necessitated an interest in understanding of rivers. He studies, studies the patterns and processes promoting the origins and persistence of biodiversity and the application of such knowledge to conservation, especially in fishes. Rick, it says here that in 2021, you're gonna release a new book, Rivers Run Through Us. Is, is the book out? Um, <laughs> I'm still trying to understand the nuances of uh, publication dates. Official date is October 1st, but you can get it in bookstores now, whatever that means. So it's out, yes. <laughs> and, we can, and we can go to our friends at Amazon. That, that's right. Nice, okay. Well, take it away. I'm gonna let you explain where you are and, and, and what, what you'd like to teach us tonight. Okay, uh, I'm just wondering, in, in the interest of time, would you like to skip right to the video or do I, no, do, uh, do, your, do your thing. No, we, 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 we want to know. Great. Okay, thanks. Uh, okay, thanks, John. Um, it's, uh, and thank you for the invitation to speak to everybody tonight. It's a great honor to speak uh, to the Explorers Club. And I'm going to talk about uh, some more local rivers, although, uh, and Jenny laid out uh, uh, really nicely the importance of uh, rivers in the origin of human civilization. So I'm going to talk about the North American context a little bit. So rivers are uh, natural bodies of water that flow within a defined channel. And they start often in alpine areas as little tiny things called rills, sometimes only a few centimeters wide. And this is the origin, the beginnings of the great Fraser River uh, of British Columbia here, high in alpine areas in the Rocky Mountains. Uh, and then they, as they pr proceed downstream, they collect lots of tributaries and collect lots of volume and sediment, and they get uh, quite a bit bigger. And this is sort of a, an area near the area where I am right now in, in BC's Caribou region, where the Fraser River here is about uh, 200 meters wide. And then they typically, uh, rivers typically end in another body of water, quite often the sea. And this image shows uh, the Fraser River Delta at uh, uh, Vancouver uh, as it enters the, the Salish Sea at Vancouver, British Columbia. And not only do rivers collect flow, tributaries and flow and sediment, et cetera, but they also tend to collect, uh, as Jenny pointed out, a lot of humans. And, and uh, this is, uh, as you can see, the high densification of human settlement uh, at, at the uh, where Vancouver or where uh, Fraser River enters the Salish Sea. Now, I became particularly interested, and I'll, I'll tell you how, in 10 great rivers uh, of uh, North America, and I'll define what I mean by great rivers in a second. But uh, these rivers and other rivers have impacted the human experience in North America for over 15,000 years, as soon as we first colonized uh, North America from uh, northeastern Siberia. And as Lawrence C. Smith nicely articulated in his great book, Rivers of Power, rivers provide us North Americans with five basic benefits. Access, natural capital like fish or uh, power, territory, a way to express power and uh, a sense of well-being. And these are the rivers that um, I've dis I discuss in this book that I've been, been particularly interested in over the last six years. The Mackenzie River, the Yukon River, the Fraser River, 
the Columbia River, the Sacramento San Joaquin, the Colorado, Rio Grande, Rio Bravo, the Mississippi, and the small, but highly, relatively small, but highly impactful Hudson River and the St. Lawrence River. Now, these rivers don't flow like if one just spilled a glass of milk on a table. The continental divides are the great orchestrators of our river's flow and define uh, where they, what sea they enter, and if, if in fact they do enter a sea. So there are the six continental divides. I'm just showing my cursor here, the Great Divide, the Arctic Divide, the Laurentian Divide, the St. Lawrence Divide, the Eastern Divide, and the Great Basin Divide. And these great orchestrators of our river's flow um, have been formed by processes that go back really billions of years. Uh, and I've just listed three here that go back at least a couple hundred million years to the last two million years, continental drift, mountain building, uh, and the great glaciations of the Pleistocene. And we're living in the, in the after effects of the most recent glaciation, which ended about 10,000 years ago. So why did I decide to write this book about rivers? Well, there's three basic reasons. Uh, this is me as a young child, I'm not quite sure, maybe 10 or 11, sitting on a river. And I'm simply trying to make the point that my father was uh, uh, an outdoorsman and he constantly had us in lakes and rivers, fishing, canoeing, and swimming. Uh, I'm also an angler, particularly a fly fisherman, and I've enjoyed not nearly as many or nearly as skilled as Mark Angelo, but I've enjoyed many fine canoe trips uh, over the years. And certainly to be even modestly successful uh, as an angler and to be successful and to survive on canoe trips, one has to know something uh, about rivers. So I've been interested in rivers since a, being a little kid, uh, up even up to the current day, mostly for hedonistic reasons. Rivers could give me pleasure. Uh, and I could experience lots of wonderful things with lots of wonderful people on rivers. And the bottom right shows a small stream in southwestern Alaska. And basically to symbolize, I became a university professor. And I have a particular interest in the origins and persistence of uh, freshwater fish biodiversity in North America. And if one wants to be even modestly successful at that, one has to know something about rivers because so many fish live in rivers. And so the, the third reason, so there's sort of the hedonistic reason, um, my professional interests. And the third reason was I have an interest in history. And this is sort of a family trait. I'm particularly interested in the history of exploration and in military history. And as I read a lot of books uh, about explorers, I realized very soon that they were either exploring river systems or using river systems to explore other areas. And so these are, these are many of the books that I started reading about individual rivers or rivers as a collective that really enthralled me, including over here on the far right, uh, the great, great book by Teddy Roosevelt uh, describing his really crazy trip down the river of drought in uh, South America. So I started reading all sorts of different aspects of rivers that were separate than my own sort of hedonistic interests uh, or desires or, or my professional interest. But two books particularly inspired me and I've got them in reverse order, chronological order uh, on the page because I read them in this order. The first one was A River No More, The Colorado River in the West by Philip Fradkin. And this is a great book. He certainly talks about um, the first peoples of the Colorado River Basin, talks a little bit about the geography of the Colorado River Basin. But what really intrigued me about this book was I had no idea until I read this book, the power of uh, the water lobby, particularly in the Western United States, to agitate and lobby for uh, water development projects, dams, reservoirs for irrigation purposes. I really had no idea how powerful that lobby was. So I thought this was really one of the first books that got me interested in the sort of nexus between the human experience and rivers in a sort of social, political, and economic uh, sense. The book on the right is by Hugh McLennan, a well-known Canadian uh, author. And he wrote this book, Seven Rivers of Canada, 1961. And as the title suggests, he tells a story of seven rivers of Canada that he argues made a nation. And so I read these two books and they inspired me because I thought, well, McLennan's book has been, it's over 50 years old. So surely there's time for an update. And that combined with books such as those by Fradkin, where I realized the importance of rivers in, in the US context, I said, well, really, instead of writing a book about rivers that made a nation, i.e. Canada, as McLennan did, I wanted to write a book about rivers that made a continent. And also, I wanted to include rivers that were important to Mexicans in Mexico, because obviously an important part of North America as well. So I wrote this book uh, that's now available and it's just out, published by Rocky Mountain Books, Rivers Run Through Us, A Natural and Human History of Great Rivers in North America. 
And I was very fortunate to have Mark Angelo uh, write the forward for it. So instead of me telling you what the book is about, I've composed a short five minute video uh, that does a much better job than I can. So here we go. Humans are naturally drawn to rivers. We are a riparian species. We live along rivers and depend on them to sustain our lives, our livelihoods, and our well-being. It is no surprise that the Fertile Crescent, the cradle of human civilization, encompasses two great rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates. Or, consider that today, 63% of all of humanity's 7.8 billion people live within 20 kilometers of a large river. Or that 93% of the world's megacities, defined as those with 10 million or more people, are built along great rivers. Rivers Run Through Us, a natural and human history of great rivers of North America, explores the relationships between 10 great rivers and the development of our societies since humans first crossed into our continent over 15,000 years ago. Rivers Run Through Us begins with an introduction to what rivers are and some of the philosophy of what drives the intimate connection between humans and rivers. Next, Rivers Run Through Us introduces the family of North American rivers and how they formed through massive ruptures in the Earth's surface, mountain building, and the great glaciations. The first of 10 great rivers explored is the Mackenzie River, encompassing 20% of the land area of Canada with a delta consisting of more than 30,000 ponds and lakes. The river valley was the focus of a massive energy corridor proposal in the 1970s, and the inquiry into this proposal set the gold standard for consultative processes and was central to the ongoing evolution of indigenous land rights in Canada. Next is the Yukon River, site of the last of the world's great gold rushes and the collective lunacy that the riches of its Klondike River inspired. The Fraser River, the soul of British Columbia, is a sculptor of biodiversity within its basin, especially the myriad populations of its five species of majestic Pacific salmon. The Columbia River, builder of an empire whose muscle was harnessed in the form of great hydroelectric dams that helped to address an unemployment crisis in 1930s America and whose power was critical to the Allies' efforts in the Second World War. Next are the great conjoined Sacramento-San Joaquin rivers, whose waters transformed a desert into one of the world's agricultural behemoths, but at great cost to biodiversity within their basins. The story of the Colorado River follows, a river sacrificed to the ambitions of humanity to build great cities in desert environments. A once idyllic delta now rarely sees any flow of water that originates more than 2,000 kilometers away, high in the southern Rocky Mountains. Steeped deeply in the history of relations between the United States and Mexico is the Rio Grande Rio Bravo. Today, it forms two-thirds of the international border between the two countries and is a source of ongoing immigration tensions, including scores of drowning deaths every year resulting from attempted crossings of the river. The Mississippi River, Old Man River, the Father of Waters, the Big Muddy, a massive river system draining 41% of the United States. Control of the Mississippi, once referred to as the body of the nation, was the major strategic objective of America's great civil war and the scene of one of its most decisive campaigns the Siege of Vicksburg. The Hudson River is the shortest of those examined in rivers run through us, but what an impact it has had. It was crucial to the development of the world's greatest financial center, and its sublime scenery inspired the first great North American school of art, the Hudson River School of Landscape Art. Finally, there is the St. Lawrence River, the Fleuve Saint Laurent. For thousands of years, it has been the gateway to a continent. The outlet for 20% of the world's fresh water, its seaway transportation system, moves the sea a thousand miles inland. Rivers Run Through Us ends with a discussion of the environmental state of our great rivers and their future, the various threats that they face, from pollution, overuse, and climate change, as well as how we might alter the way we interact with them 
to rediscover what hydrologist Luna Leopold called a reverence for rivers. To ensure their and our persistence into the future, these great rivers, through which the history of North America has flowed, deserve no less. Rivers Run Through Us, a natural and human history of great rivers of North America, will be published in October 2021 by Rocky Mountain Books. So that's what the book's about. And uh, I'll just finish off with um, highlighting one of the chapters uh, very briefly, uh, the Colorado River Sacrificed. And because it's so much in the news uh, recently. And the issue with the uh, Colorado River now is encapsulated beautifully in this famous line from the equally famous movie, uh, Chinatown. Either you bring the water to LA or you bring LA to the water. That, that's it in a nutshell. Uh, and before I get into that issue, I just wanted to point out that uh, the Colorado River, like all the rivers in this book, has a very long pre-human, i.e. geological history, and a fascinating uh, human history that are, that are dealt with uh, in the book. But the Colorado River has had a troubled recent history and has an uncertain future. Uh, and the system has been completely replumbed by uh, many, many dams on the system and, and reservoirs for agricultural and irrigation uh, support of agriculture. Uh, of course, the two biggest are the Hoover and Glen Canyon dams, which create the two largest reservoirs in the United States. It's a critical water supply for 40 million people. This water supply is shared amongst seven states in Mexico. Uh, the water allocations amongst those jurisdictions were set almost 100 years ago, unfortunately, when water supply input to the system was higher and uh, demand was lower. Uh, and the issue now is such that the first ever water crisis was declared on the river by the Bureau of Reclamation uh, this past August. And this is an article uh, from the, there's my cursor, uh, for, from The Economist uh, showing the infamous bath, so-called bathtub ring. And this is this uh, light colored band, which represents the difference between um, where the current water level is and where, where so-called full pool should be. And this is about 161 foot deficit and stretched along the whole length of uh, Lake, this is Lake Mead, represents a lot of water that isn't there. And the problem is basically uh, has, a, has two basic sources. The first is a lack of supply. There's decreased Rocky Mountain snowpack uh, and increased water absorption on land. And the declining snowpack in the Rocky Mountains is something that's been uh, observed uh, for a number of years now and is projected to increase into the future. And there's gonna be more precipitation as rain at other times uh, uh, that, that won't be sort of stored for later melting uh, as snow. And of course, this increased evapotranspiration and increased water absorption by land, resulting in less runoff into the system, such that the, the total run through the system now is about 20% less uh, than we're sort of used to. And these are, both of these issues, these causes of lack of supply of water are largely driven, not completely, but largely, largely driven uh, by climate warming. The so-called millennium drought that we're in, we've been in for the last 21 years, including portions of Brit uh, Western Canada. And the graphic on the right just illustrates uh, different different uh, extremes of, of the drought condition as of August uh, of this year in the southwestern United States. The second problem, of course, is too much demand. Uh, and this stems from poor policy and the fact that the allocations were set almost 100 years ago. We're simply expecting too much of the river. And this has resulted really from, as Mark Reisner said in his great book, Cadillac Desert, the go-go years of the so-called go-go years of dam and irrigation development in desert environments. And John Wesley Powell, one of the great characters that I talk about in this chapter, uh, you know, many, many decades ago said you simply couldn't do it. You couldn't develop the area as people wanted to in terms of for irrigation because it just wouldn't be able to sustain it. And he's turning out to be true. And remember, this is in the fastest growing region of the United States. But there are some solutions um, to this. And as discussed in this article, conservation, water conservation does work. So it's interesting to note that La the Las Vegas area has reduced water use by 23% while adding almost a million people in the last 20 years. And basically, as this the quotation below, it states, we need to make brown the new green and some areas like Las Vegas are, are doing this successfully. Secondly, there need to be reforms to agriculture, uh, how things are irrigated and what crops are actually should be grown there uh, given a lower water supply. And, and of course, and progress is being made uh, on that as well. And thirdly, the Colorado Compact, this sort of set of regulations and agreements that apportion the water amongst the seven US states 
um, it runs through 2026, but it has to be re renewed after that or, and uh, renegotiated and reform of the water laws of which this portion of the US has just a bewildering array of different water laws. Um, it, it, that simply won't be easy. The whole thing can be summed up at the quotation at the bottom. We have 19th century laws, 20th century infrastructure and 21st century problems. So uh, that ends my comments. And while I'm uh, unsharing my screen, I just wanted to leave you with some quotations that I've found over the years of different aspects of rivers. So back to you, John, while I unshare my screen. <laughs> oh, those are extra. You don't need to see those. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, Rick. I, I, I have one quick question. I, I was stunned by that Las Vegas figure that the population has grown by a million, yet uh, they've, they've got more water. How, how did that happen? How does that work? Uh, well, making people pay a bit more for the water they use and, uh, you know, regulations about how, how you can use water. In other words, uh, um, efficiency and if, if it, yeah, it's definitely efficiency. Also, you know, uh, lawn watering regulations, that sort of thing, encouraging people to plant different types of gardens, stone gardens with drought tolerant plants, that sort of thing. Hmm. So, in, and then going back to your other reference to the, the film Chinatown, uh, we knew who, and by the end of the movie, we knew who the bad guys were in, in, the, in the filming, in the film version. I mean, today, who are the bad guys in regard to draining the, the, the Colorado River? Uh, I, I don't want to single out anybody. We're all, we're, we're all bad guys in that sense. Um, it's not just the Colorado River. There's other areas, uh, as I discuss, where we're misusing rivers. So we're all, we're all kind of bad guys. Okay. Uh, well, we have a, we, we can start out. Any, anyone who has a question, please uh, send it to chat to the chat. Um, there's a question for Professor Taylor. What is the meaning of river, river to you personally, and how have you bonded with rivers that you explored during your time with them? Oh, that's a that's a great question. You know, what, um, what is it about rivers that really attract you? Or yeah. Well, uh, I, I discussed this a little bit about the book in more general sense, but but to me, um, they're the ones I go to mostly. They're usually in the most beautiful areas, so I can't separate a river from the surrounding landscape, the watershed. So the, the watersheds they're in just attract me. I think it's the flow. I, I love lakes. I, I'm I'm at my place right now on a lake, um, but there's something about the way a river is always changing. Uh, and the sound of a river. It's it, those are the things that just just compel me. I just I just love them. Yeah, I think this. I think the sound is is perhaps mm -hmm. the, for me the most relevant. Yeah. Uh, and Jenny, are you there? I see your name, but I don't see your face. Yeah, I will. Nice. Yes, I'm here. <laughs> so, somebody has a question about Fragmighty. Yeah. Is, do you see that in the Middle East where you're working? Yeah. So Fragmighty is. It has several Latin names, but Phragmites uh, communis or Phragmites australis, same thing, um, is endemic across Eurasia. Um, it's been in the U.S. for quite a long time, but relatively recently, within the past several decades, what appears to have happened, and this is actually a bit of this is my hypothesis, is the so-called M haplotype Phragmites. That is, Phragmites that's a lot taller and a lot more robust than what's been hanging around here for a long time, got introduced somewhere in Eastern ports. I suspect it came in from the Middle East um, because the Phragmites there is much thicker and taller and Conservators don't like it because it outgrows local strains of Phragmites as well as other reeds and makes for much thicker and denser cover. And duck hunters particularly don't like that. It also interferes with the nesting of some birds who don't like cover that tall. Um, here in South Carolina, the horrible thing that happened as a result was massive spraying of herbicides into the wetlands to kill the Phragmites. I would argue Phragmites is what the British use for thatch. And I would argue that the better role for Phragmites is just harvest it to destruction and use it. <laughs> right? Yeah. It's just yeah. a grass. Yeah. It's yeah, yeah. not an evil being. <laughs> right. Well, here, here in the Hudson Valley, in the Hudson River, we have a serious uh, issue with an invasive 
species allegedly arrived from China. It's a, it, in, in English, it's a, a Chinese maple. And it's yeah. this nasty little spiky seed mm. that grows in the in the river bottom, and then it covers the river surface yeah. with. with it, there's no doubt that invasives are well invasive. That's why they're invasives, not just naturalized, right? right? They're not just you know they're not day lilies. They don't look pretty in the ditch, but <laughs> they crowd out other species. They interfere with. But Phragmites has actually been around for a very long time. It's this new M haplotype that's causing people problems. And, mm. you know, I, I, I don't know the solution to that, but feed it to your livestock. <laughs> well, that's right. If they could come up with a, if they could come up with a way to use this, unfortunately, yeah, all they do with this stuff on the Hudson. Thatch your it. roof with it. That's what yeah, they do yeah. with it in England. Or, or find, we need to find a recipe for it. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah the, actually, <laughs> go on, Rick. I find yeah, I, I find that from your talk, I had no idea that Phragmites was the the reed that was so important in that area because I find that really interesting where a, a, a genus at least uh, can be so important and so critical to people in its natural environment, yet in its introduced environment, it's a real pest. And and I know in Eastern Canada, there are Phragmites, invasive frag Phragmites that are just as you're saying, it's actually creating more land and destroying the spawning habitats of fish that like the natural vegetation. So that's really interesting. Yeah, well, and another one like that in the Southwest, the evil reed is giant reed, Arundo donax, hmm. um, you know, which was introduced by the Spanish because it does a very good job of stabilizing slopes. So where you've hmm. got, you know, wadis, uh, arroyos, uh, intermittent streams with a lot of, you know, a storm surge, it's really good at helping hold the slope together. And that was fine as long as the, uh, Spanish and their successors were running cattle along those riparians because the cattle would just eat it down to the ground. But once they pulled the cattle out of the riparians, in order to stop the cattle interfering with other local species, then guess what? Arundo just made it, formed cane breaks, mm -hmm. right? But once again, the solution is easy. Harvest to destruction. Harvest it and feed it to your livestock. And yet, you know, we don't have that tradition, so we don't think to do it. <laughs> and, and this is maybe a question for Stefan, who's not here, but but maybe you guys can jump in. It, uh, this is a question from, from another Jenny. Uh, it is said that China has 11 operational dams on its section of the Mekong, and that a further 11 mainstream dams are in various stages of planning and completion through Laos and Cambodia. Many involve Chinese investment and construction. Is the Mekong Agreement working in terms of respecting water resources management practice? Who is keeping an eye on this agreement? Again, that may be a question for mm. Stefan, who's probably asleep in, in Sweden. <laughs> uh, yes, I'll, I'll, I'll defer to him on that one. Okay, okay. But I would venture that given the nature of a lot of other agreements and given particularly the area where it is, I bet you it's not working. <laughs> That's right, yeah. Well, and I, I can speak, of course, to the Yellow River and, and, and the elimination of the gorges by the Three Gorges Dam. I, you know, the, the diversive of massive water sources within China and completely flooding out what once were highly productive riparians mm. has been a portion of national policy for the last several decades now. Mm. So. Well, I, I wasn't able to see the little video that we played early on about the taking out the dams on the Hudson. But what, what do you think about that notion of dam removal? You know, some some people are quite big on it. Some people are thinking maybe the money's we better spent, you know, elsewhere. I am, I'm I'm curious. Yeah, I know. Uh, well, I'm I'm a big fan of it, um, particularly in places like. Um, well, I know that, that what used to be the biggest dam removal project in the U.S. the removal of the Elwha two dams on the Elwha River on the Olympic Peninsula. And within the same year that they took those dams down, salmon were poking their noses uh, upstream of where those dams were. Yeah, so yeah. If, we, if, we can replace, if we can replace the power it, with other ways, either conservation or other types of, um, of power generation, I, I'm all for it because, um, I don't know, rivers, rivers need to be let to be rivers. Be free flowing. Yeah, be but here, flowing. In, here in the Hudson Valley, you know, we're not talking about the Elwha. We're not, not talking about the Hoover Dam. We're talking about, yeah. and, but, and the point that we make all the time is that when a fish runs into a six foot dam, it might as well be a hundred foot dam. It doesn't yeah. matter. They can't get up and over that. 
Um, well, so it, it's it, like anything else. It has to be planned. And, and, you know, what are the objectives of removing the dams? And if you, just to remove one or two high profile dams for a show, it's not going to do any good. Right. If they don't remove the little tributary dams, I agree with you totally. Yeah. 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 And, but it, it also this whole issue of dam removal is kind of a reminder of how we tend to, we as a species tend to construct and then just walk away. You know, most of these dams yeah. were built in the, you know, around the turn of the century and no one ever thought, oh, well, we should take them down. If we're not using them, we yeah. should deconstruct them. Instead, yeah. they just left them, you know, here, here in the Hudson Valley, we, we have a, a proliferation of uh, abandoned IBM buildings. You know, when <laughs> IBM shut down in the mid 1990s, they just walked away and yeah. left these massive, you know, hundreds of acres of, of property covered with these massive buildings, which will, at least so far, are being very under, under, under reutilized. So. Yeah, well, uh, that, that's on we, us. Have the, we have the same issue with uh, a lot of uh, oil wells in parts of Western Canada that are no longer profitable and companies often just walk away from them and, and the taxpayer has to foot the bill to clean them up. Mm -hmm. And those impact here, the local rivers. Here in South Carolina, uh, American Rivers has been pretty effective in working with regulators on uh, undamming especially all this, the, the myriad of small hydroelectric products, uh, projects that are, are, are small dams. They're not actually a significant part of the energy mix. There's now other options such as solar that are far more productive of power. But the biggest backlash against dam removal here is the recreational sector. Yes, that's very All true. of those fishing lakes that have been created by dams. Yep. They don't want sturgeon running free right. they want bass <laughs> yeah. right yeah, very, very, good. very true yeah. they're, they're well they're, they're, it's sort of the sh whole shifting baseline idea their baseline is there was no no river here it was it's now a lake it's full of bass and catfish their baseline is i've got a lake house a pontoon boat and a bass and a bass rally to go to and, yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a tough nut to correct correct for sure but if you took those dams out the the water would still flow or we would return to flowing. Well, the lakes would empty though. These are, these the are. Have, but there would be other fish in the river. There could be other things they could catch. Yeah, but you, mm -hmm. your lake house would now be on dry land. Okay. Oh, and, and your pontoon boat would be stranded in the mud. And I mean, I'm not saying that I agree with this approach. I'm saying this is a significant sure, lobby. Sure. We're, no, no, we see, we're yeah. talking about we, every we, lawmaker in the state being one of those people. Yeah, we see, we see dams all the time. They're used as real estate come-ons. You know, they, yep. they, they up the value of the property yeah. by, by tens of thousands I mean, of dollars. When, my in fact, ancestors... they're, 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 when in fact they're dangerous and, and somebody's got to either pay to fix them or take them out eventually. We've at least here got Department of Natural Resources is cooperating with the idea of at least allowing flood pulses, that recreational use can't just completely overwhelm um, water discharge requirements. And that has been helping um, a certain amount. I, I, we have, I'm, I'm getting some questions here. So if you don't mind, maybe I'll share them. I think this is probably for, for Rick. How are First Nation leaders working in Canada to, for river, on river protection and renewal? Um, well, there's, there's certainly uh, a very strong movement to sort of have uh, local input and local control to uh, river restoration and management of the resources in the rivers. It, it's still uh, sort of uh, in progress in terms of how it like, for instance, the Fraser River has something like 64 First Nations on it. So it's, it's quite a complex set of arrangements and the fish salmon, of course, migrate through the whole thing of it. So in order to create those different uh, agreements, it's, it's a work in progress, mm. but it's definitely being encouraged. And there, there are, have been some successes for sure. And, uh, co-management, co self-management, definitely. Hmm. Someone is asking, uh, what are the top lessons learned in the Hudson Valley that can be applied to river conservation anywhere in, in else in the country? Um, mm -hmm. Again, you know, we, we're very fortunate. The, the this whole it's now called the Waterkeeper Alliance, which is, an, which is an umbrella group of 300 plus river keepers, bay keepers, Gulf keepers around the around the world. Um, I don't know about lessons other than just presence. Having a presence on the body of water makes a huge difference. It's mm -hmm. like when, when you, you, you drive by a, a state trooper who's parked on the side of the road, maybe even with a dummy sitting in the seat, you slow down, <laughs> right? Yeah. 
Yeah. And the fact that the, that the Riverkeeper boat is out there patrolling, John Lipscomb, who's the Hudson Valley River, or Hudson River Riverkeeper, does 5,000 5, miles a year. Just going up and down the river and talking to people and, and that presence makes a huge difference. And, and that's, I think, what's one of the things that's been learned on in, for, and taken advantage of by these other 300 odd, odd groups. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I drive across the, the bridges that cross the Hudson River every day. It's incredibly beautiful. Rick, you mentioned it in, in, your, in your review of the Hudson Valley painters. They came here for a reason. Oh, yeah. They stayed for a reason because it was incredibly beautiful. But, you know, I drive across, it looks different every day. It's, you know, the clouds, the sky, the, the, the color of the water, the wind, uh, et cetera. And then I take a deep breath and I'm reminded that the Hudson River is the largest Superfund site in the United States. Mm -hmm. Thanks to PCBs dumped uh, between 1940s and 1970s by GE. It's an issue that's still not been resolved. They've taken some stabs at it, uh, mm -hmm. but it, it's, and, and as long as you don't, kind of go in muck with the river bottom, it seems to be okay. But, uh, you know, the state has said, if the federal EPA doesn't pay for it, the state's gonna pay for it. Well, that was under, under our previous governor, Governor Cuomo, who hmm. is now gone. So we don't know what the new governors take on, on cleaning up the PCBs and river, but it, it, it's a reminder that uh, the, the, the beauty is a, can be a little uh, misleading, a little, a little right. false sometimes. Yep, yep, for sure. Ask Jenny questions about fires. Maybe what we can do to protect our rivers. There you go. Fires. Fires. I'm, I'm, I don't have a translator here, so. No, uh, it's actually an excellent question. Nice. So what we see in the West is a problem common to all arid regions of the world. And I'm more familiar with this in Turkey because Turkey has stuff that can burn, whereas Southern Iraq, there's not much left that can burn other than oil flares. Um, a number of things are actually dependent on soil moisture. So how, how thick is your soil? How active is your soil? How much water can your soil hold? And when you reduce riparian, so I would include all wetlands in that, whether it's the huge floodplains of the Yellow River that the Shang civilization grew in, whether it's the huge estuary of the Thames, it's not just about the Thames River, it's about Dog Island and the estuary and its productivity, whether you're talking about London or Berlin or Moscow, you should also be looking now that all of these places are threatened by increased temperature with what happens to cities once their soil moisture becomes marginal. And what happens is fire, okay? Fires happen in the grasslands, fires happened in the brushlands, fires happen in the forest lands. And instead of just being a little fire that maybe sort of renews locally, you get huge fires that not only burn whatever the top cover is, but burn the soil itself. We've seen this most recently in Georgia where a flash fire ran out of control. And is that I relevant, this, is, Jenny, is that relevant in, in the American West and California? Absolutely. I saw this firsthand in a big way with the Cherry Fire um, up in uh, the mountains just to the east of San Diego. I was actually defending my dissertation on the day when the fire jumped all the roads, the Santa Anas that came roaring down towards I-5, the campus was closed. We had to flee. And when I came back three days later with it rescheduled, I mean, there were people around, basically half the county was black. Every place I had ever hunted, fished, ridden my horse, or done anything was black. And this time it wasn't just the light ground cover overgrowth that was burned off, it was centuries old, pine just are now toothpicks much like the yellowstone fire the, the, what do rivers uh, have to do with this well it's rivers and their riparians and their huge flood pain plains and all their tributaries that are part of the water sequestration they're part of what helps water soak into the soil and then support tree recruitment for the trees to grow back up or brush recruitment if you don't have enough water for brush or whatever recruitment mm -hmm. so what more heat means and what fewer rivers mean and what more rivers constrained river floodplains mean is less soil moisture everywhere else and higher chance of fire. 
Well, while, while I've got you and before we bow out for the evening, I, I, want, I wanted your experts take on uh, my theory that there are more uh, environmental activists in the Hudson Valley per capita than anywhere else in the country. I'm posing it to the, uh, the, the Vancouverite, yeah, yeah, which no, is no. Pretty, pretty tough competition. And yeah. South Carolina, I'm not, I don't know so much about. What, what do you think? No? Well, South Carolina is interesting because South Carolina has a huge population of extremely serious hunters and fishers. And by that, I don't mean folks who don all the gear once a year and go out and play deer hunter. I mean, folks who use game <laughs> to feed their families, folks who use game fish to feed their families. And while they don't seem natural allies of the environmentalist movement, here they are. No, they're the, they're, the canary, the they're, the, they're the canaries in, in the mind, so to speak. Yeah, the, the, they, the, they don't the argue that climate change is happening. They see the seasonal shifts. Yeah. They see that the hunting seasons are no longer matching, you know, the, the actual seasons. They see yeah, well, the, the, the people who started, population. who began the Hudson River Keeper were fishermen. Yep. Yeah, they saw, I mean, we, they saw ours is the Congaree you. River Keeper. Yeah, yeah, and it's just tagline to that. I decided after all this experience in Iraq, what should I do? I found the tiniest, teeniest, tiniest little watershed there probably is. It runs through my neighborhood. It's called Brickyard Branch. And it's called Brickyard Branch because it's the branch that used to run by the brickyard. And it's <laughs> now, not, now not, not much more than a little outfall drain for stormwater. It used to be actually quite something. And so house to house, we have now formed the Brickyard Branch Watershed Association, allied with the Congaree Riverkeeper. And I just have to say to everybody, wherever you are you're on a watershed and your tiny little piece of a watershed is a piece of a river and if you can't save the whole river go out and do something to help your watershed nice. plant a tree no, I, I i will defer to you I, I i will like you did with mark i will uh, accept your statement that there are more per capita in the hudson river valley for sure and in in the chapter on the hudson river in the book i talk about the hudson river being a river of american firsts and if it doesn't have the highest density, it's probably where the whole thing started yeah. in the Hudson well, we, River Valley. We take credit for, be, for being the, the home of the onset of the American environmental movement. Again, oh, d- deserved or not. In New York, you take credit oh, we're for New, We're New Yorkers, yeah. So what do you expect? Yeah. <laughs> and exactly. I say, John, you're to you. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, th- thanks to, to Mark Angelo. Thanks to Stefan Lovgren, who couldn't join us tonight. Thanks to Jenny Purnell and to, to Rick Taylor. It was a very fun evening, and uh, I hope Thank those you. Who, no, I hope those who tuned in uh, learned something. I certainly did. Yep. Great. And, Thank you. Yep. Thanks See a lot, you guys. Bye bye. I was supposed to show my jar of Euphrates water. <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> Here's my jar of Euphrates water. Yeah. No, I will not drink it. <laughs> well, and thanks to the to the Explorers Club for hosting us, and we'll see you we'll see you again uh, a year from now on. Uh, uh, I guess it, it's America's River Day, Rivers Day, International Rivers Day, World, World Rivers, Day. Rivers Day. Great. Thank Everywhere. you again. See ya. Bye. Bye.